I want to welcome all of you tonight to the College of Complexes. Let's get order again. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name, or, my name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you. The college consists of the following format. First, we have our speaker who will, first we have a brief announcements period. Then we'll have our speaker who will speak. Then we will have a question and answer period. And then our speaker will, uh, and then at the end of the night, can, we have our infamous rebuttal period. After that, our speaker gets the last word. Funny how today is the 30th anniversary of a wall coming down and windows going up. The Windows operating system opened up the world to the computer revolution while the Berlin Wall came down. Unfortunately, I think history is repeating itself with us building a wall on our south border. Perhaps maybe we should look back 30 years and learn. All right, if Bob Lichtenberg is ready, let's uh, have him come on board and uh, tell us about making meaning of life. Let's welcome Bob Lichtenberg. to make meaninglessness, and they'd probably do a very good job of that. You know. That's probably where they're at right now, making meaninglessness. I'll talk a little bit about that. But I just had a horrible day. Nothing worked on the computer. I just had my floors refinished, and Comcast pulled out everything, threw it all in a big ball. It was hard to untangle, and uh, I kind of got done, but I couldn't get it to work many hours. Uh, so this talk is going to be much abbreviated from what I wanted it to be. Um, but next week I'll have that full handout with the tips and all the background. I'll have that next week for you. And be fuller next week because I have another week to work on it. Maybe I can get that computer to work by then. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of hang loose here and do it by the seat of my pants. It would be a lot better if I had my hand out and you would have the hand out to follow. I always believe in giving those because that could be something to take away. Otherwise, you might only remember one or two things. I know I would. <laughs> That's why I always like to give them the hand out and I'll give it out next week. But. Uh, all right, uh, meaning, a little background on meaning first. Okay, take a look at the screen right there, you'll see what's on this. All right, uh, what is meaning? Well, it's in general having significance, it's the significance of anything, the importance of anything, how something matters in the world. Um, so everything has meaning. Everything has a relationship to something else. And uh, no matter how much, that's the only idea that's universal or applies to everything. I spent 40 years teaching philosophy. Um, philosophy of life, though, not that academic, useless stuff. <laughs> Uh, and that's what they call, they call the universal applies to everything, but I know no other idea that applies to everything. Only meaning applies to everything. And uh, furthermore, meaning is our greatest idea and our greatest value. It's the most important idea we have, almost by definition. Because uh, all the other values like goodness, beauty, truth, justice, um, uh, they all have meaning. 
you know, so meaning encompasses uh, you know, so all, all the values. Um, so it's our greatest value, even though we rarely even say the word, and even though um, yeah, it is very undeveloped. Uh, I believe my book on making meaning, which I'm going to summarize briefly right here, is a making more meaning one. Um, it uh, was the first book to fully develop the idea, but then I realized people don't read much, they never will. This reading's hard, it's a bunch of abstract ideas and letters, it's very difficult for most people. So I condensed the book and I bridged it and made it much shorter. Uh, and I got tons of help from Doug Binkley on the computer. He helped me enormously. I never would have got it out. And it's not really his field, but he tried real hard to get it done. Let's give him a hand. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. Bob Otherwise, we would have. What's up? Bob did meaning to my life. <laughs> there you go. Well, without Doug, there'd Bob. be no books on meaning. It's, there's a few books on meaning of life, which Tim mentioned, but that it's kind of different. Meaning of life, like what's the grand purpose of my life? By making meaning is this, how can I make as much meaning as I can? You know, how can I make the most of what I do? That's a big difference, I think. So, so we look at uh, making meaning. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what making meaning involves. It's the significance, the importance of things, the relation things, relationship to things, to everything else. Um, oops. What do you want to do, Bob? I want to go to the next. Uh, just, just hit the hit. Just hit the slide. There you go. Uh, and it's, it's right on the front. Oh, it's kind of hard to read. I'm I'll sorry. bring the it's computer a little closer. Us. I'll get the computer closer. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can bring it all the way up. Okay. Some people say no, I got enough meaning. I don't need more meaning. Yeah. Well, if you didn't have enough meaning, you would uh, commit suicide. You'd end it all. Albert Camus said that great French uh, uh, novelist and philosopher. Don't commit suicide. Yeah. You'll commit suicide if your life lacks meaning too much. You'll end it all. And he's darn right about that. That's you use that's a what microphone. Say. Your life lacks meaning. So that's yes. why they kill themselves. Oh. Uh, Can you use the mic? Well, but then I can't see the screen. Okay, no, no, just pull it out. I take it off and put it in your hand. Yes. Uh, take, take, uh, oh, 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 oh. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, we don't need this one. Martin Boomer, my buddy Boomer. One of the few things I like. <laughs> he was actually a theologian. Uh, that's one of the sources of uh, meaning, making meaning, is to have a community, a bunch of people working together, playing together, acting together. It's one of the main ways of getting meaning, a source of meaning. There's a lot of them. Uh, there's relationships, there's community, like that is. Uh, there's work, there's art, there's search for God, a bunch of them. Uh, hmm. I mentioned art. Well, okay. I don't think I mentioned art much. Just talk, so let's get that one. Uh, I just saw this one today. I was downtown. I said, not why I went to the Humanities Festival. No, that's all right. I won't talk about that. Uh, not tonight. Uh, well, I won't talk about the dancing Chiva either uh, because um, it's art. But I want to say one thing that I really admire about Shiva, female goddess of the Hindus. Notice how she has four arms. She has four arms because she's very busy. She's creating the universe and she's destroying it. <laughs> so she's got a lot of work to do. She creates and destroys in an endless circle of fire. That doesn't really look like fire around that ring, but that's what it is. Uh, you never see that in the West. You, you don't find that in Western art. You know, the four arms. Or a female goddess. Uh, this is from the collection at the Art Institute, which is a totally awesome place. Created the best museum in the world by some magazine. I agree with them. And uh, yeah, I was there today. I shouldn't have went there either. <laughs> but I can't help it. Um, 
right, maybe I'll come back to Beethoven and Renoir again from the country on a summer night. <clears throat> Those people are in love, they're in general love with each other, love with the night, the music, the dance. All right, but let's get back to meaning, let's see. Um, Stick it in that level. Just stick I'm talking right. a little bit more about what meaning is. This is uh, my book on tips for making meaning. I only got one copy so far. Doug Meekly did the cover, and he explains it inside. Use the mic. Yeah, hear me. Sorry. Use the mic. Try and hold it up. Just, just put in that middle. That see that middle thing there, Bob. Wants to cover me. Bob, you can put in that middle thing there too. Oh, okay. That that. Yeah, that might be better. All right, so I say meaning is our greatest value and our best idea. My definition of meaning is to have a positive impact. Uh, a good effect, a good relationship, good influence, doing something good in general, positive. I hope no one will quibble about what is good. Yeah, there's some borderline cases where it's real hard to tell, like an abortion. For an uh, older woman unmarried, that was, that's hard to tell if that would be good. That's very, very difficult. Very agonizing. But most of our actions aren't like that. Most of our actions are pretty clearly either good or bad. Most of them are good, fortunately. But um, yeah, I define meaning as um, <clears throat> having a good influence, good impact, good effect. Um, Doing things that are positive, affirmative, constructive in general. Um, doing it, acting on it, not just thinking about it, making meaning. Philosophers just like to think. They don't like to act, they don't do much acting. <laughs> but um, that's the real test, is if you do something. Uh, okay, that's what meaning is in general. That's how I define it, say what it is. Any questions or comments? Any disagreements? Let's wait till the question time. I don't know. I don't like to go along. I don't like following strict rules. Anyone have any questions? Where are you going, Bob? Um, well, he's going to keep talking, kind of on and off, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're going to let us kind of talk, and you'll keep talking? I was thinking I mostly give tips and you can comment on the tips as we go along. No poison. Commenting on all the tips after I mention them all. <laughs> probably forget to deal with them. So as we go along, please have questions. Just raise your hand. Yeah, no. I'll make a comment. I like your idea of taking comments <laughs> as opposed to just questions. In general, I've been frustrated with the complex formula of just allowing questions rather than questions and comments. At, at the socialist conference you do a question and a comment because I think that is well, how there, we make there, meaning in, in, there. There. in a group process. Um, sure, give and take. Yeah. Right, and you know the, it's an intergenerational. Also, I like I'm, my favorite philosopher is John Dewey and um, mm -hmm. he would talked about you know education and democracy and um, I think it goes along with this idea of the end in view making meaning it's you know the eye of the student um, it, it's a very subjective idea but it does seem to define um, I, the idea of people just making tools or you know that sounds stupid I think making meaning is more descriptive of what is knowledge than and who we are than just the others. So I agree. Okay, good. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process too. You know, it should be an interaction. It shouldn't be just one person giving out the whole truth. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be working together to find the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what I mean by um, meaning. Going to make meaning. You have to do something that um, benefits other people or yourself. You can make meaning two types people, yourself and others. 
Not better if you do it for others, because then you double your meaning. You almost have double meaning. Um, that was one of my tips <laughs> I got into already. Uh, is there a definition between finding truth and making meaning? I mean, do you separate, or what's the difference? Well, um, uh, making meaning is action to make the world a little better for you having existed, you know, even if it's a tiny bit. That's making meaning, but defining truth, that's more of a theoretical concern, <laughs> finding out which ideas are correct. That's usually no problem for little facts, but it's a huge problem for values uh, like goodness, beauty, and justice. That's really difficult, but it can be done, as I'll mention, uh, to de two degrees, <laughs> not completely. Um, Okay, so uh, you can make meaning for yourself or for others. Better if you do it for others, because then it, you double your meaning. You get meaning out of that, and the other person gets meaning. Um, uh, um, uh, and the best way to make meaning is to improve your mind, because then you can think about other ways of making meaning. Improve your mind. Improve your thinking. And uh, one excellent method of doing this is to read. Read serious materials. I know it's not popular whatsoever. <laughs> but it, it does really improve your mind better than anything else I could think of. But it's a slow, gradual process. And uh, it's indirect, too. But you do, you do get to be a better thinker if you do read a lot. You know, uh, so you would improve your mind. And that's the best way of making meaning for yourself or for others. Um, okay, I won't go into it any more detail here. I might do so on my handout next week if I get my computer to work. But uh, isn't the reason that we're here is to make meaning? I mean, what other reason can there be? What greater reason can there be for making meaning? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, oh, Alana's motioning to the water like she always does. Uh, uh, we're here to make meaning, maximize meaning, make as much meaning as we can. Why, why, else, uh, why else do we exist? What better purpose can we have? What, what greater goal? What could ennoble us more? What could enrich our life more than making meaning, especially for other people? Hmm? Anything better than anything higher, anything greater, as I have defined it? I can't think of anything. That's why I picked it. That's why I developed it. Andy. There's a quote from Horace Mann that says, Be ashamed to die until you have won some new victory for humanity. What, one sub, what he Be was ashamed to die until you have won some victory. For victory. victory. Yeah, that's what I thought you were going to Yeah, I like that quote. <laughs> yeah, you have to win a victory for others, no matter how small. But. Do something for others and yourself, mostly for others. And otherwise, you ought to be ashamed of yourself and be ashamed of dying if you haven't really done anything for others. And a lot of people fall into that boat. A lot of people fall in that category. The most meaning they make might be for their family. And that's the American way. And that, that state, you know, that's really self centered, narcissistic, greedy, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, you uh, try and maximize meaning for others and do some good for others. And why else are we here? What greater purpose can there be? Uh, okay, I think that's enough background on meaning and making meaning. Uh, I could try and motivate you, but uh, I'll do that here. Uh, maybe just a few more comments. Um, So actively help others in whatever way you can. I do it by writing about it, and potentially all people can read about it and be in print forever, in case anyone's ever interested in it. And uh, I'm sure someday people will be interested in making meaning. They're not much interested in it today. You don't see a big movement for it anywhere. Uh, you know, you do see a lot of not making meaning. I see a lot of people escaping from making meaning. 
they're escaping. They're trying to get away from making me because they realize it's too hard and they don't know how to do it. So what do they do instead? I saw this on the L. You know, all they're doing is playing games on there, and then they're looking at junk they could buy. You know, that's all they're doing. I didn't see anyone reading the book. I didn't see anyone with an e-book on the L. Now, nobody. They're all just screwing around, playing games, escaping from making meaning because it's too hard. And it's an American. <laughs> an American is all me, you know, all for me, everything for myself and my family, if it can keep that together. <clears throat> uh, so try not to um, escape from making meaning, try to make meaning. All right, the tips I'm going to talk to you about, I collected them, uh, as it were. I used to write them down in index cards I kept in my pocket. Now I just got my <laughs> CTA card and my uh, Art Institute card. Don't go see Andy Warhol. He doesn't have any CTA with me. And he said 70 years ago, it's nothing new there. Um, uh, yeah, I used to write them down, I wrote them, wrote them down, and I collected them, and I wrote them in a, in a journal. I published a journal called The Meaning of Life, and then one day I wrote a letter to the Tribune, Chicago Tribune, so I got them in the journal. And it, make, it might make a different story for you, because uh, it's different. It's different. There's no journals on The Meaning of Life. And you know what? I sent it to the Tribune, and it was about you know, a few sentences. And they sent out a very good writer, John Anderson, and he wrote an excellent job, piece on that. Uh, <coughs> terrific. Uh, article feature. Can go out? Yeah, where's the microphone? Sounds off. Did the battery go down? Or? <laughs> I need to talk up. All right. Um, I'll try and speak louder, as loud as I can for a while. Uh, what are they doing, though? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so the Tribune wrote about my journal. It appeared in there, and I uh, got 3,500 subscriptions to my journal. Because it appeared in 35 other newspapers, it was featured there, too. So, a good article to get. Can we get a copy of that article? Or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll bring some next week. Next week that was a great article, you did a great job. John Anderson, from the Tribune. Uh, okay, I'm going to get something about done with all the background. The tips are commands, that, that commandments are telling you what to do. I don't like being in that position. But that's the nature of a tip or advice. Um, okay, and uh, I'm going to use a female pronoun, she, because the male pronoun has been used long enough. I use that in my writing. All right, here's a few tips now, and please comment on any tip as we go along. Uh, the main way to make meaning, anyone got a guess? Want anyone want to guess what the main way of making meaning is? The most efficient way of making meaning? How would, how would you do that? You know, this is Make actually, a logical <coughs> argument? Mm, that's way up near the top, but not quite at the top. Uh, Say something useful? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's near the top, too, suggest something useful, but uh, it's a little vague. It's actually in the textbook I used. The last section was on the meaning of life. But uh, the main way to make meaning is to connect with something bigger than yourself. Like good people don't quibble about good. Philosophers will quibble all their lives about what's good, you know, and they never get anywhere because of that. But you know what a good, you know what a good, good person is when you get to know them. Connect with good people, worthy social causes, and God is the biggest. But the hardest, if you can connect with God, you really got meaning. You can make a lot of meaning. <coughs> All right, another tip. Um, try and do whatever will stimulate you mentally, like watching quality YouTube videos, reading books, watching quality TV, radio, movies. It's hard to find the movies. 
Okay. Have to go down by the lakefront to find one now. Well, you always pretty much had to do that. Uh, but try and be in touch with everything that would stimulate you mentally as much as you can. Yeah, try to make meaning every minute you can. Because their lives are short and they go fast. You know? And you could really add a lot of quality to your life if you uh, make meaning. If you try to learn something, like I was just describing, stimulate your mind. That would add a lot to the quality of your day. It certainly has to mind. Um, okay. Please make comments if Bob, you ever have any I, questions. Can, can Bob. I make a comment? Another one? Yeah. I, I like your idea. It it kind of sounds like I said, like John Dewey or philosophy of education. And I find in my own experience that if you're writing and then you read and then you write, you know, you're it's kind of like a conversation with the other writers, the great writers, the great thinkers. You know, it's kind of like you have to write an essay when you're in school. It, it helps to write in order to read, you know, um, and I think that's kind of like science as well as art. Maybe that's the arts and science, right, that, that there's, <coughs> does, that, does that fit into your philosophy of tips or something, the idea of writing, oh, yeah. summarizing and, and com reflecting on, commenting on what you read and a situation? Yeah, I think writing is a very good way of making meaning. Uh, because as I stated, you know, you get it out there, you get it in print forever, and if anyone's ever interested, they could always look it up. And it's there forever, it's there for everyone, anyone who wants it. It's, it writing's a good way of making meaning, I think. One of the best, although it's hard for a lot of people. Uh, I, I'm a fan of John Dewey, too. He's one of my favorite philosophers. And the question is, do we, do we or does me? <laughs> <laughs> well, he does. He does it. Uh, okay, let's move on with some more tips. Um, um, okay. Try to use the word mean whenever you can. Well, try to refer to it explicitly. And then you'll be more aware of it. And you'll be able to make more of it. Um, so, we discussed this at the Seekers Dialogue every last Friday of the month. I have a dialogue. There's one coming up after Thanksgiving this month on Love Part 3. Turn out in small. I guess when people aren't interested in making love, they'd rather make hate, I guess. That's what people aren't here. They'd rather talk politics. Yeah, good luck with them. Good luck changing the world. Good luck changing anything. It's not really going to happen. We're, it's a little bit too little to make much of a difference there. But, um, well, off the track. Um, Oh, multitasking, yeah, we talked about this at the Seekers. We meet the last Friday of every month, my bungalow, or my yard, if it's warm enough outside. Um, and uh, we talk, raise talk of the philosophy of life and uh, making meaning. And one of them we talked about was multitasking. And I'm a big fan of that. Uh, try and do it whenever you can, try and do more than one job at a time. Of course, uh, sometimes doing two things would be too much and you have to focus on only one thing. But uh, you could usually do a lot at one time. And the brain is good at multitasking. It's not good at doing a single task because <laughs> it doesn't focus that well. It jumps all over the place of the mind, right? the brain. Um, um, my favorite form of multitasking is I take my dog for a walk She's not on a leash because she obeys very well. So she gets great exercise. And I'm reading a book while I'm walking and I'm getting some needed exercise too. 
and they carry a bag for picking up litter, and they pick up litter and put it in a bag. And the bag has a logo of an yes. for profit to advertise that. You know, see, I'm multitasking a lot of ways. Also, uh, you know, people see the logo and they say, well, maybe I should get down to the Art Institute. You know, I haven't been there in many years. <laughs> it's an awesome place, like I said. And uh, maybe I should be reading a book. I haven't done that in many years. <laughs> Either, if they see me do it, they might be more inclined to do it. Because humans are very imitative animals. If they see us, you know, just lounging around doing nothing, that's what they'll do. That's what most people do. They screw on their phones, their, their cell phones. You know, and play games on them and shop on them. Certainly not read. They don't see anyone else doing it. Otherwise, they they be kind of isolated. All right, multitasking. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, be careful where you walk. I never had a problem. I never had a problem with that. I never fell. <laughs> I never even tripped, you know, but, uh, or stumbled. Uh, oh, well, kind of related to that when I'm driving, don't stop for stop signs unless there's a car or a policeman or a pedestrian or a bike or something like that. Don't stop for that one. Why stop? It takes a lot of gas. It wears out your brakes. You're just wasting time. <laughs> Yeah, most of those stop signs are not necessary. They're on the track to be every corner. You can look and see if anyone's coming. And, uh, you know, take, take uh, care, precautions, not to hit anyone. But uh, I've been doing this for years. I've never got a ticket. And I've saved a lot of time and a lot of breaks and a lot of gas this way. Yeah. Um, so I encourage you to blow off stop signs. <laughs> and you can take the side streets. Instead of these congested uh, thoroughfares, these are awful these days. They're all packed up, you know, most of the day, most of them. Uh, okay, more tips. Uh, oh, logic. I said I'd talk about logic. There are laws of logic. Um, uh, logic is a study of good thinking. There are some rules for good thinking. Uh, and it does have rules. There are rules that were collected by Aristotle. Oh, I can show you a picture of Aristotle. <laughs> uh, he collected them all in the 4th century B.C. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, wait. <coughs> and there are rules for good thinking. Like, for example, Ellen mentioned use arguments. That's a bad word, though. Argument sounds like you're disagreeing. But an argument in logic is uh, uh, defending a conclusion with some premises, with evidence, so have evidence to back up your belief. Have a, have a rational assumption, a conclusion, and then support that with premises. Um, that's the first rule of logic, is always use arguments. Oh, argument sounds like you're disagreeing and fighting. There's Aristotle, I think. Mean, there's Plato's cave. He's not my talk. Uh, I, I, that's a great figure, which I might briefly mention later. Aristotle devised all the rules of logic. He came up with such rules. Other rules of logic are uh, induction. Induction is where you think about the facts logically. And you do that by getting factual instances, and then you may get several instances, and then you could lead to a generalization as long as you follow the rules. You know, and deduction is the opposite mental process. You go from generalizations, and then you can squeeze out particulars from these generalizations, like all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Of course, Socrates is thought he is immortal pretty much, but uh, that's an example of a deduction. There's all kinds of rules, there's all kinds of wrong ways of thinking, like fallacies or mistakes. There's hundreds of those, and it's good to know those, to know when someone's made a mistake. But you could really say, you know, I'm being logical and you're not being logical. If you know the rules of logic, and not many people do, hardly anyone does. And courses in college tend to be, uh, Mostly deduction, which is kind of a math, math, math with words, <laughs> is deduction. So that's not much help. But logic can guide your thinking. So I would use logic. 
to govern all your thinking, follow the rules of logic, know the general rules of logic. I got them as appendixes in my law. Uh, not this one, but uh, follow the rules of logic. You know, to, um, to get to the soundest conclusions, and you can even use it to uh, evaluate opinions. You could judge an opinion, which, which ones are strong and which ones are weak. They're not all equal. Some of them make a lot of fallacies. Some of them have good deductions, good inductions. Even opinions can be judged. And these rules of logic, they apply to all societies at all times. You know, I like absolutes. Absolutely, and Aristotle came up with this as a method to guide thinking. He used it as a method of philosophizing. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I, I have a hypothesis. My, I have an idea that, like they say, all articles start with a, a hypothesis in a way. But, um, and one is that the, the current, I like that, the Federalist Society is saying the judges are using deductive logic separated from inductive. Or it, it seems like there's trickery that goes on with when our, you know, they say, uh, you know, let's go to the state's rights, you know, or using the Constitution kind of deductively. Uh, do you, have you ever seen anything like that rather than this kind of an honest inductive, deductive uh, balance? Logic. Well, I don't, as I mentioned, I'm not big on politics or the law, so I don't read much of that. It's pretty dry stuff for but one it, thing. <laughs> it can be used to take over the country, politics as yeah. law. You know, uh, like I think there is Carl Schmidt, Hitler, they came up with, oh, yeah. we're in a state of terror, let's, you know, um, therefore rights are suspended, we must uh, have executive power. You know, that you can make up a law and that's not um, scrutinized by the people, the reason, you know, um, in totalitarian governments. You, you know what I mean? That, um, that is a lot of that throughout history. I have a hard time naming an example. I refer to a prime example, how he duped and told him. Um, the most best educated society at, uh, in the world at that time. He duped all of them, you know, with his propaganda. He knew how to use it. And lawyers often do this too, all the time, just to make big bucks for themselves. You know, on a much smaller scale, of course. You know, but yeah, it's a freaking practice of politicians and propaganda. Right. Yeah, yeah, lawyers. It's so freaking I can't name too many more examples. <laughs> but I'm sure you you're familiar with them too. <coughs> and your knowledge of history and your dealing in that area. Oh, uh, yeah, that uh, leads to the next tip. The next tip is to um, <clears throat> appeal to people's emotions, emotions or their feelings. Uh, that's where we live, no matter what we say. <laughs> a lot of times you're saying we're rational, and a lot of times people think that they are being reasonable. I mean, a lot of times they're not. A lot of times we're going by how we feel good or bad, you know, about something. We really go by that much more than our ideas. Our ideas are dry, dead, and cold-blooded. They're cold fish, you know. It's hard to get excited about them, most of them. Uh, but we really feel strongly about our feelings, you know, what we think is good and what we think is bad. As I said, that's where we live. That's our level that we're on. Um, Uh, okay, uh, I can say something about art from there, which I'd like to do, but um, one, other, one little thing before I do that. You now what you really need to get people moving, get them motivated, and to help others make meaning, you need to appeal to people's will, to their willpower. You gotta get them to want to make meaning, somehow. And I don't know why, because, I don't know how, I don't know how, because, uh, like, uh, Plato noticed long ago. Oh, you've got a bag. Your foot is... Plato noticed long ago that emotions are basically irrational. They, they make no sense. They, they don't lend themselves to ideas. They're even difficult to name them. It's hard to name them. 
And the uh, same is true of the will. You can't really say much about the will. It's irrational. It's not consisting of reasons or ideas. It's just the will is wanting to do something. The will is feeling something, you know. Uh, the will is a little bit susceptible to reasons. You could reason with a person. You could argue with them a little bit. <laughs> it's not likely to go far. It's hard to find people who are very open to other ideas. But uh, it's possible to some extent. I wouldn't say a big extent for most people. Most people are setting their feelings. You know, what, what they feel is true and right. They go by that. Okay, can anyone help me on that? I'd be eternally grateful if you could tell me how to move people as well. <laughs> it's simple. Ideas, but simple. I got a good one already. Learn to do a good presentation. Learn to speak and do a good presentation. That really moves people good. Yeah, that will, that will if you have an open audience. Uh, they, and they, most of them will. You think so? They're yes, I know so. Like President Trump. <laughs> no, not Trump speaks off script too much, and he doesn't make, he doesn't convey his meetings well. No, not at all. I think that. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. I've got an idea. No, learn, uh, it's certainly part of it. Just being an actor. I think I'm recognizing the crowd. I think, I think you love. All right, order, please. Go ahead, Raj. You love and you care, then you make some progress. Okay. Yeah, how do you care? Order. How do you get someone to care about something? That's my. When point. you care for somebody, and then it makes it, it helps you to make a meaning. Okay. You care for others. You don't uh -huh. wait for others to care for you. Yeah, but their basic caring is so hard to get anyone to. Do you care for oh, Use the mic, care. please. You, your will, you suspend your will. There is one um, secret. I think, I know. All right. The whole AA program uh, talks about will. Your willful versus willingness. And so like the first or the first through third steps, a person makes a decision to turn their will in their life over to the care of God. How do you get them to do it? They... They kind of listen, there's a culture, there's a lot of repetition, okay. but that is the core thing. That person has to make a decision. And I, I think All if right. they see other people That's sharing their experience, strength and hope, how it helped them yeah. to turn their will over. All yeah. right. We are very immature. He has a, he has a comment there's over a here, too. Okay, You're changing sure. people's will. The one thing people want more than anything else is somebody to listen to them. If you have 10 minutes to witness to somebody, spend the first nine minutes listening to them. And once you've listened to them and they know that you are interested in them, then they're more likely to go along with what you're proposing. I got to listen to all this nonsense? <laughs> yes, sir. You listen. Uh, I'll be the Cerbic again. First time tonight, he's late. <laughs> Who's that? He's behind the schedule. Nonsense, I'm <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, we want to listen. We want to be listened to, but how do you make someone listen to you? Listen to You present well, is what you do. It's called presenting well, it conveying your ideas and making a good speech. Oh, that's theater. It may be theater, Charlie, but it works. It doesn't affect the other person's will if they don't want to listen. If they don't want to listen, but you can certainly convey a good meaning through a good, well-rehearsed yeah. and well-done presentation. Social change by theater. It's work, Charlie. Where? Every, well, Hitler, for once, Hitler he did it. Bully. Huh? And also, bully. also with a good, good, well-designed campaign commercials, good, well-designed prep people knocking Hitler on did. doors. Good, well defined yeah. logic. <laughs> what about John That's stuff that actually point. works? What about John Kennedy? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Bravo, bravo. Bravo. If you're interested in a person and then, and you're really listening to them, then they become more open to you. I care about all of you. You ignore that rule. 
and you might as well not do anything. Well, yeah, then it'd be hopeless without it. But, you know, we, at least we have a little hope. If you care, and you get people to listen to you. I care for all of them. Yeah, that would turn the well some up. <laughs> That's a big job. It's very difficult, very hard. We tend to be sitting there for days, as I mentioned. All right, uh, let's get back to emotions. Uh, I, I want to say a little bit about art and getting meaning out of art, making meaning, not by creating art, by, but enjoying and appreciating art. And if you make meaning, you can get adult joy. You get real joy out of that. You might get fun by shopping on your cell phone and playing games on it. You know, that's fun. That's for kids, though, really. Uh, well, not the shopping part, but <laughs> the game show. Uh, and that's all I saw on the old And I was looking. I was looking at all the cell phones. And almost everyone had one. You know, if they didn't have a cell phone, you know what they get? Nothing. They just stared at the walls like they used to. They stared out the windows in the, <laughs> in the subway. <laughs> Can't see anything out there. Uh, all right, let's get the... Uh, uh, time terrorizes all of us. That's not hard, but uh, time is a terrorist. There's never enough time to do what we want. You got to make as much right. money as you can as fast as you can. I'm getting hard. Uh, okay. Uh, that's a little bit too theoretical. Uh, Constantly kind of just try and feel things. For no practical, feel artworks, feel them for no practical purpose just to enjoy them. And I'll give you a few examples of that. Uh, there's a, a Chicago Picasso. What is it? What is it? Well, it's not realistic for one thing. It's a jackal. It's just done by six. It's an Afghan cow. What is it? An Afghan hound. Yeah, it does look like an Afghan hound. Yeah, you don't have a point in there. It's a bird. Uh, yeah, it's a bird. It's a money relaxer. It's a woman. Okay, it could be a woman. What does it mean? What does it mean? It means many things. It means the artist needs help. It means Chicago and all its mystery and its diversity. Ah, many things. Yeah, that's my interpretation. It means Chicago and all its diversity. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. Profound. And Picasso is great at creating forms like that, mysterious appealing forms. This is great. I asked the original Mayor Daly what it was, and he said it, it, it can be anything you want. It was the, the most brilliant thing he ever said. Uh, <laughs> I think Daly was much of an art lover, not the old man. The son more so. Okay, we talked about dancing. Sheila, dancing to create the illusion of the world, which she will destroy and create again. Ah, oh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Uh, now uh, then, they can make meaning out of that. It has no words. How do you make meaning out of classical music? Changes um, your mood. Just listening. Hmm? It changes your mood. You can yeah, be very depressed and very angry or whatever, and you listen to music and it can What does it change them to the Beethoven's Ninth? Pardon me? What does Beethoven's Ninth Symphony change your mood to? Um, Hopeful? How does oh, Beethoven's I, Ninth? Dun, 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 dun. Isn't that the one? Well, How is it changing? Make you feel patriotic? See, I don't want to damage What about the Imperial March in Star Wars? Uh, yeah, how powerful. Um, Beethoven himself said, wrote, it's an ode to joy. It's a feeling of joy. It's joy and triumph. That's All right, Alana. What about finding meaning with the Nationals winning the World Series? Okay, but listen, can I say? So, okay, so meaning, to me, meaning from music, like you mentioned, 
It's like listening and enjoying, right? Yeah. It's enjoyable. Joy. I don't want to get Pretty mentioned. Simple. So, uh, so meaning like listen first, enjoy. Yeah. That's what meaning for music. And sometimes it change oh, mood, right? Sometimes it change attitude. And music bring to us meaning, right? Yeah. Classical music. Yeah. Emotional meaning. Exactly. Emotional meaning. Feelings. Basic feelings, yes. Mm -hmm. And strong and powerful. And it can range from joy to sorrow. Yeah, and you can't express greater sorrow than Mozart's Requiem for his father who tormented him. <laughs> yeah, and the grief he feels. There's no greater sorrow than could to be heard. Oh, I, I have a problem. We heard the other night? That's right. We heard that the other night. Okay. Oh, yeah? Church. Uh, the, <laughs> what, what do you think of the Imperial the March church? of Darth Vader? Dun, 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 dun. That's another one that gives you a lot of meaning. Yeah, it feels a more obvious meaning of... Uh, <laughs> uh, Very yeah, emotional music. Yeah, and it is set in outer space that makes it uh, more appealing. But it's kind of elementary, I think. But it also gives us a lot of powerful meaning to the song. Uh, sure. You know, it's a, it conveys, sure, it conveys it. Sure, but doesn't like Beethoven. Uh, I disagree. I think uh, Beethoven was a was a nuthead. But I, th I still think we got some better classical music today than we've ever seen. Look at look at look at the classical stuff that Bugs Bunny did in a cartoon, <laughs> and the Warner Brothers Orchestra. They really did some good uh, yeah. meaning to music. What do you mean Beethoven was a nuthead? <laughs> yeah, Mickey Mouse, Nicole Stokowski's here. I remember that was Disney, though. There was, uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, uh, Mickey Mouse. Charlie's had his hand up. All right, Charlie. Hi. I'm having a little difficulty ascertaining how you differentiate between what is what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And according to you, I should go to an art, the art, an art gallery or an art museum. But you also disavow that I should not go to a political rally to listen to someone running for office That's who will set policy. And I don't understand this. Um, going to a museum may bring me meaning, but by my attention to politics, I can affect the meaning of untold numbers of people. Okay, sure. And what about the sheer? And you just, you just said, where is is going to political rallies on okay. your list? Okay, well, I don't think that would make a difference. What? You have in the union, so that's excellent. Not many people do that. What about what about the sheer joy of seeing your sports team winning, like the Cubs in the World Series, or the ones you wished to for when the Nationals won? Some yes, stuff uh, does go, some good does come out of Washington, you know. A little bit, but uh, that's more for little boys who get too much yeah, energy and need to play sports. Yeah, radio. Sick, I, 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 I take I take strong offense at that thing. I find that there's a lot of meaning in seeing your winning team win as a spectator sport. What does it mean? Don't they don't stand for your city? They're mercenaries. They go where they get the most money. The athletes. You know, how that the team is a significant part of a city's infrastructure, and you know it's like Chicago was a two-party town. You have the Sox and the Cubs. Bob, I, can I make a comment? Uh, I, I think it's interesting that it's like a teacher. Socrates, you know, did the dialectic and teaching. And this is the most dialectical kind of teaching that we've seen here because you're asking a question and everybody's making meaning and we, we kind of synthesize it collectively. And it it just shows that it's the process. That he gave this us a list of theory of inquiry one and, one at a time. and oh yeah, group people one at a time making meaning and synthesizing <laughs> others ideas building on them disagreeing logically and dialectically mm -hmm. sure, there's different forms of meaning but i think there's different degrees of meaning too yes these could be evaluated by logic as i suggest <laughs> That's a long process, and it's not simple, and it's not real what, obvious what either. Process you but I think it can be done. 
Uh, we don't have time to do that. If you're willing. Uh, well, yeah. uh, I don't know if I should listen to my radio or, or go vote. Or do what? Or go vote. What do you say? Oh, listen to your radio or go vote. I mean, if he wants to go to a ball game and he crews meaning by it. Now, I always understood that if you had air cell on your book, an air cell just said do what is natural, what you do by your design. So if you act like you're human, do human activities, and that's sufficient. If you're cat, do cat-like things. And if he, if he likes that, that's a human activity. What, what's, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, as I said, that's, that's all. Okay. I mean, you're making a list. The Buddhism has a list of 254 things. It's already been done. I should use their list. Well, sure, they're but one thing you're not really getting at, and if you can get at, is what goes on at a football game. What goes on in the crowd? What are they going through? What are they experiencing? What generates that feeling? Lots of emotion and lots of hatred. Emotional, spiritual experience. Yes. That's what we're trying to say. And conquering the other team? Of course. I get meaning by killing. Yeah, right. Oh, Charlie, that's... Yeah. Uh, no, that's one third of the war. Killing, killing and murdering is, does have meaning, certainly for the murderer, for the victim, it does have meaning. I should have, um, and I forgot to mention this at the start, I, I uh, can't really go into uh, meaninglessness. There is negative meaning. We do use the word in the bad sense, you know. Like killing gives meaning to a murderer. Oh, and, Smith, it gives meaning to a murderer. Uh, and to and the victim's family. Like the but that's very hard, hard to describe. It's very hard to talk about. I'm it, not sure how you it, do it. And what, what, now one thing I want to emphasize is that there's an abundance of meaningless in this world. There's lots of meaningless. We all die. Everything dies. I and mean, it doesn't take us too long to do it either. And how do you deal with that? A lot of our plans and ambitions are going to be frustrated totally by society. And how do you deal with that? Um, you know, Bob, uh, Bob, in the Republic, one third of the people were physical. And he said, make those the warriors or the soldiers. <laughs> and they like physical things, physical activities. Now, according to your, your thing, there's no meaning in their lives. No. Um, now they, they like sporting activities. It gives meaning to their existence. It's totally appropriate. No. They are doing what is in accordance with their nature, and they're not doing anything that's ethically protecting the community. It's not an unethical activity, and they're never going to an art museum. And they ain't going to listen to Beethoven. <laughs> Their lives have no meaning. Uh, they, um, well, anybody who's been in the military, they're trained to kill. Yeah. And that's, and that's their main purpose when you're in combat. Right. Somebody's trying to kill you, you automatically try to kill them first. Does that give their life meaning? Anybody who's been in the military, knows that and has experienced that. Yeah, Some people have been in combat and have had a very intense experience. That may not be an activity or meaning that you like, but it's a valid one. <coughs> yeah. I just said that. Your but, list. Um, yeah, uh, in Plato's Republic, he does classify people into three classes. The lowest for Plato is a tradesman. Maybe the working class today. Well, more like business class in the U.S. And, and, and then, <laughs> and then uh, Plato, well, that's Plato. the, please let me finish, that's the, um, that's a level of meaning they can attain, and that's fine for them. And they ought to strive for that, but they also ought to go higher. The military is the second class for uh, Plato in the history public. And these guys, back then it was all guys, <laughs> they need to have strong wills, and if the leader says to them, go kill, they go kill. And they don't ask questions, you know. And in the it's Republic, not their job, it's not their role in society. No. And in the Republic, the philosophers were the politicians. He chose them to do it, and according to you, philosophers shouldn't be engaged in politics. 
Now, no, no, I didn't say I, that. But yes, you did. Yes, so you did. You said on any number of occasions you disavow politics. And I've got it pretty clear. Now, no, Plato, no, it's just the opposite. <laughs> you have a, a, a duty to the people, the philosopher, to be engaged in politics. Well, yes. not physically for me. I might do a little bit in writing on it, but I don't think that's going to have much of an effect. Anyhow, I could think of more beneficial ways yeah, I could use my down. writing because I'm very skeptical. And down. my doubts about what I could do politically, because uh, it's just too big for me. It's too large. Uh, Bob, can I make a comment to that? <laughs> kind of All right, right. let's politics. let her make a comment. I wanted to comment to Charlie's comment is that either Alan Bloom and um, Leo Strauss at the University of Chicago deliberately wrote about Plato in a way that is kind of interpreted to him as wanting, you know, a, like a Machiavellian, you know, political dominator. And actually the spirit of Plato was much more of an educator, you know, a philosopher, not a king as much as a philosopher, a teacher should be a philosopher, it, but it, it, you can twist the meaning of something. And I think what really, you know, they, they made Socrates take poison and die. That, that is just like they killed Jesus on a cross. It's possible for the state, political state, to kill the philosopher. And that, that's what is really we've got to watch out for. And, I, I take it down to institutional institutions, corporations calling themselves people and then abusing their power because, you know, a, a corporation is not a state, it's, it's not a person, a state is not a person. They should not be able to control society, control the media, control the war. They, they have to be regulated and constrained. But right now, you, we're going to end up for forever war. That's what happened with Hitler. That's what happened if you have a covert people, you know, making meaning that is actually kind of deceptive and the people don't have a way of stopping it. You know, the idea of democracy was that, you know, people are representative and rational and um, seeking wisdom, sharing wisdom, making meaning, you know, um, but it is possible to shut down the philosopher, you know, teacher, um, and and just dumb everybody down and send us to war and, and just destroy the whole thing. It's been done many times, well, the fall of the Roman Empire, you know, and it's done by, you know, this twisting logic of what he's trying to say and making, oh, he was a political guy, you're a political guy, you're telling people, you know, don't go to the Bears, you know, yeah, being a bear is nothing. Run for office. No, <laughs> or, uh, I'm saying you're trying to, you're like a teacher. You were the true philosopher. Uh, the spirit uh, of Shakespeare is, is to teach and make meaning in a collective he way. Says, Don't vote. Not like Sparta did. What kind with of advice Athens. is that? Don't get involved <laughs> in campaigns. All no, right. You, you better have an, an educated electorate yes, to have a, a vote. You know? We have to have an educated electorate, and we also have education and free media. You can't have it. And we have we have a. Okay, Bob, go ahead. We discuss real issues, not just propaganda. For we are discussing real issues, and that's that. And that and that is a lot of sense that. Uh, we got to have a good presentation to really get our clear ideas about logic and about philosophy. But there's got to be discussion. Uh, well, there, there, there is discussion. You're wrong. Yeah. Not many others. <laughs> Please, let's let, let's let Rod channel the next comment. You know, look, I think this thing doesn't work for me. Whatever you might think. Lady, lady monopolizing, she should be there on the stage and sit down. Let her speak. Okay. You're not the first come one. On. To I mean, well, well, come on, come on, what is this? He asked for comments. You give a lecture, you give a lecture, and then we ask questions, and then we leave a talk. It works. That's authoritarian. It's fine. Answer. And then people ask questions all the time. I understand. Uh, let me get back okay. to the Republic, uh, Plato's Republic. 
Uh, we went through the tradesmen and the business and the working class and then the military class, the second, according to Plato's classification. Uh, the third class, and he said this is the hardest of all, is the philosopher king. And we'll have a just republic only when philosophers are king, only when philosophers, sorry, when our rulers have the spirit of philosophy, so we have a long way to go in that regard, David. Um, and I want to talk about, about that, as I said, but, uh, yeah, they should be presenting ideas. I love this image of the cave. This is terrific. This is a good day for Plato. He says, we're like people living in a cave, an underground dead. And we see, um, we see images on the back wall of the cave, reflected on the back of that cave. They're like prisoners chained up and looking at the back wall of the cave. And we see people walking by that roadway, and they're carrying things, and the fire is reflecting their image Thank on you. the back. That's an excellent image for what, what do we have today then? And people think it's reality, but, but it's only an image. It's only a weak reflection, says Plato. All right, I thought you'd, you'd be able to get it, but uh, this is a good image for our cell phones, our smartphones today. People think that's reality. That's the biggest reality to most people today. You know, they think their phones are real, and they think their phones are giving them reality, but it's a weak image. And there was a good image of that before the phones. Anyone? Television. People saw images on TV and they thought those were real and mistook those for reality. Like Hitler's, um, or is this Hitler's movie? Um, no, I can't think of the name of it now. It did convince a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Hitler's movie, Triumph of the Will. Yeah, Triumph, Triumph of the, the Will. will. Thank you. That's Thank you. Well, Plato says somehow you got to struggle for you. you got to break your chains from inside yourself. you got to break your chains and scramble out of that cave uh, of darkness and get out, get outside to the daylight and then you'll see the stars and the moon and the sun and those are all symbols for values and the last of all things we can gaze upon and then with much difficulty is the sun. The sun, and that's an image for the good, or it's also an image for God. Uh, do I talk about that? I don't know. It's a pretty atheistic place here. Uh, you know the, oh, Sinker, Rodan Sinker. He's straining uh, <coughs> uh, all of his muscles, and even his brain, you can feel his straining. Um, do you know what he's, the usual interpretation of what he's um, thinking about? His own mortality, his own death. He's thinking about that. That's a frequent um, interpretation. Where did that, oh no. I'm looking for God. Uh, all right, there he is, an old man in the graveyard. Uh, is that God? Does God exist? That could give you a lot of meaning. If, if you had any evidence that God truly exists, you don't have to have physical proof because God is spiritual. And it, it goes way beyond physical proof. Uh, but if you can have any good argument for God's existence, you would have a lot of meaning. Now, uh, ignore the word shutter, shutter, shutter stock there. Uh, but uh, that's the Big Bang, an image of the Big Bang, the explosion at the Big Bang. And uh, scientists have now determined that before the Big Bang, there was absolutely nothing that existed. There was no space, no time, no matter, no energy, nothing. There was nothing before the Big Bang, as far as we could tell, uh, because that would be very difficult. Anyway, that's good. Good evidence for God. What else we got? Uh, Aquinas. Gave five arguments for the existence of God. I'll, I'll just name a f few of them that gave God meaning. By the way, he was the first one to do this, and this was the 13th century. <laughs> and 
Yeah, you wait 13th century for someone to think, oh, hey, maybe we ought to have evidence for believing in God. But his first argument was the creator argument that the universe requires a creator. It can't come from nothing. There has to be something that's first. There has to be a first cause. That's what he called it, a first cause, to make all the other causes that we see. All right. Um, Bob, let's kind of start wrapping it up in five minutes. We'll go straight into rebuttals. Oh, yeah, right. We're not having questions. What? Okay. Oh, and another way, just a minute, Charlie, another way of um, knowing about God is to uh, have a mystical experience, and Thomas Aquinas wrote about this, and he did mention it briefly. All his arguments are very brief, but um, there's St. Teresa of Dalila, and she's having a mystical experience, an angel is piercing her heart with an arrow sent from God, so she's experiencing God. But look at the expression on your face, what does it look like to you? This is for the guys only. <laughs> Doesn't it look like she's having an orgasm? It's like a sexual experience for me. It looks to me like she's having an orgasm. Oh my god. In Teresa. Uh, had a great, uh, no. But we still, there's always going to be room for doubts. Uh, well, you can't say, we don't know, we'll find out the meaning when we're dead. But if you wait to then, it's too late. If there is a God, you're in deep doo-doo, you know, because you didn't look. In the meantime, you didn't try and know the meaning of God. Many people do that. Many people just ignore the God question. Say, I'll find out later. Well, well, then it might be too late, as I say. Oh, you know what those are? Doug, what are those? Doug, what are those? Yeah. What is that called? No. So you have to make a decision. What's the God? question? What are those? What's that a picture of? Uh, galaxies. Galaxies. It's from the Hubble telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was only used uh, starting in the 1970s, so it's fairly recent. But they take photographs of the universe. And what they find is millions of galaxies. And these galaxies have millions and billions of stars, uh, like Arthur Clark wrote about. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but, and the different colors are due to different ages of the galaxies. But there's millions and billions of galaxies and stars. How significant is a human in that scheme of things? How big are we? We used to think we were everything. You know, but uh, but Hubble has changed all that. Well, Carl Sagan's daughter gave a talk at the Humanities Festival. I had to miss it because I was at another conference. So well, it didn't sound that good. Those are different symbols of the religions of the world. Do they worship the same God? No, very different gods. No. You know, the gods in Eastern religions, they're not even creators. They don't even conceive God as a creator of the universe. And you see as the flow, the power of the universe that you're supposed to be in touch with. They're not too concerned about the afterlife either. And Buddha, Buddha, who I'm going to talk about uh, at the uh, Seeker's Dialogue at the end of the month. I don't see him here. Oh, it's the third one from the top. Buddhism says the whole point of uh, life is not to be reborn again. It's so terrible. <laughs> He said, no, she should try not to be reborn, never to, you know, go to nirvana. Nirvana is a state of non-existence, and that means blown out. You're blown out like the flame on a candle, he compared it to. And you're gone. You're gone for good, and good riddance. It's no fun anyway. <laughs> uh, that's how they look at it. But you could enjoy your life. Buddha was fat. <laughs> you know, he liked to eat, he liked to enjoy living. But he says, you know, we're just separated from God. Uh, if there is a God, but it's not a feeling God like we know. I guess that's it for religion. Uh, yeah, I gotta wrap it up. Let's see. Anything else? A uh, couple minutes, Bob. So we gotta go to the bus. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I did hit all the main ones.
Well, one thing we can do is make the holidays more meaningful by putting up decorations. I always do that. I put lights in my window in my garage. I look out on my back porch, hey, hey. my back den, uh, and I see the turkeys. And I just took down the pumpkins and the orange lights. And this makes me feel the seasons are more meaningful. And I put them out in front for people passing by, too. Uh, and uh, I would write summaries of um, everything you hear. Write it down, otherwise you're not going to remember much. That's what I'll bring it next week. I'll bring my hand out next week. I think I have one last. I guess. Let's conclude then. Yeah, I know about your history of your neighborhood, know about the history of your city. That gives meaning. Uh, I always ask about the meaning of everything. That should be the first meaning that you ask about. What does it mean? What's its significance? What is, what's its impact, especially for good? Being fully aware, there's an awful lot of negative meaning, meaninglessness. All everywhere you go, there's a lot of meaningless. Always fighting, meaningful, and often um, beating. <laughs> um, I hope you're not overwhelmed by all these ideas. I'll put them in ready next week. For Buffalo. Uh, so, uh, thanks for your tips and thanks for your yeah. All right. We'll go straight into rebuttals because of the unorthodox nature of the quote unquote discussion. Well, we questions and answer period all through. Yes, I know what you're saying. Yeah. So, let's get up to the rebuttals. Uh, let's have a show of hands. Who would like to give a rebuttal tonight? Hold your hands up so I can get an accurate count, please. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. You're not going to say anything, Charlie? Yeah. You will. Oh, okay. <laughs> Six, seven. Yeah, well, uh, eight, let's go about, uh, about four minutes apiece. I'll go first. You want to hear about the Cubs and the Sox? I've got enough in my life. The speaker's in yours. Now, here's a poem on seeking meaning. Bob. A very brief poem. Pass this one around, please. By William Maria Wilkow, one of my favorite poets. Okay. And here's a handout. You could take this. All right. Pass these out before. These are about the intangibles, the immaterial, non-physical realities like goodness, justice, beauty, truth that I mentioned a few times. All right. You could take one of these. Making pictures of something they can't really do, but something they can make tremendous amount of All right, of we need to clear the floor so we can get the rebuttal started. Into it. I'm going, I'm going. To me, what has real significant meaning is when a speaker comes prepared with well thought out arguments and well thought out pre pre prefaces and a logical presentation. To me, meaning when you're in an audience, it means something to be up here. It means a lot to prepare, be ready, and uh, take questions. I didn't, myself, I thought the words of Solomon might put it up well. Of the making of many books, there is no end. And much study worries the body. Here is the end of the matter. Here is the conclusion of all things. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the sum of the whole duty of man. Thank you. All right, next. Next. Uh, thank you, Bob. Very interesting. I hope to finish your first book one of these days. Uh, and it's my failure, not your book's yeah. failure, that I haven't completed it yet. Uh, first thing, I, uh, second thing I want to say is 
I've got a uh, cell phone. Okay. It's called a jitterbug. It's for old folks mm -hmm. like me. You open it up and you can poke in numbers and it'll make a call for you. Obviously, I don't use it very much. It's not a big part of my life. Next, I want to talk about two failures in my own life. The first one is uh, after I got a master's degree, I used to go back to school. Remember TV College? Yes. Yeah, well, I started with that 60 years ago. Anyway, I took a course, Introduction of Philosophy. I thought I did very well and thought I should get an A at the end. I got an I, incomplete. incomplete. But then I thought, wait a minute, why the hell am I here for? What am I here for? I'm here to learn philosophy, not to get a grade. I never went back to have that correct. But that's a failure in my life. The final failure in my life is I was a rehab counselor. I had a client, middle-aged white lady in a wheelchair, and wanted to go to college. Don't ask me what topic. But she went to college. When she got done and got a degree, she didn't go to work. I failed. 28, non-rehab. But did I fail? She stole an education. Thanks, you paid for it. I think our money was well spent, in my opinion, even though I got a 28. Thank you. All well right. I, I came with a great deal of, great deal of expectation from Robert. Just, just, just looks like everything went out of way and mixed up and I didn't, I didn't get much. And I feel sorry for that. I think uh, our old format, moderator should stick to it. Exactly. Because it works very well. It has worked for 50 years and no reason to change at this point. That's right. I, I, I did not have no problem. Uh, the, Mr. Paydock and I probably exchange email every day and we disagree. 95% of the time, <laughs> but, but I do understand what he's talking about, and he understands what I'm talking about, and that's all it is about, because we understand the meaning of what he, he comes from and where I come from. I, I never had a problem, particularly the, you guys talking about philosophy and all those things, about philosophers, I, I don't go, I go by myself. And do you know something, the amazing thing, over the last four, five years, I must have talked about 200 individuals on a late front during summer. And do you know something? They got a lot from me, I got a lot from them. I, I ask them questions, and I ask them about their life that nobody else asks. I say, how is your education? How is your relationship with your parents? What do you think about church? You know, do you go to? Do you don't go to? Okay? And say, do, do, do you get advice from anybody? Anybody takes interest on you? And do you know something? We have conversation. And and they get they get a lot for lot, lot from me. That somebody cares. Yes, exactly. And I get, I understand a lot more what is going on with young people. I mean this is you know, I'm 80 year old and this these people are 20, 25, 30 year old. Okay, it works. I mean, come on guys. Mm -hmm. It's not a big magic. Right. You don't have to go to a church. You don't have to be a philosopher and when I understand what meaning is. Meaning is that you love, you care, you know, and, and it works. You, you bring the best thing of you and people open up. And that's the meaning. I, 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 I could not understand why, why, should we, why we should make so complicated. Of course, I mean, we understand politics. Everybody disagrees. It's no big deal. But everybody understand what it is. 
It's not that we don't understand what Democrats are for, what Republicans are for, or what Trump is like, or what, what Clinton was like. We understand. But that's not a problem. That's really not a issue. Okay? Meaning is there. It just, we want to be happy. We, we want to be happy. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I mean, the, the, I think, uh, the, I, I, I don't, I don't like religion, but I will tell you one thing. You. That Jesus says they love everybody. Thanks. Love is the thing, right? And do you know what people do? People don't love. You are more Christian, more Hindu, more Muslim. You don't love. You know, because Jesus said one thing, and then other dudes came, and they say, hey, hey, you are not Christian, you are not going to go to heaven. The Muslims right. say the same thing, okay? That's Come true. on. I mean, it may be true, but what I'm saying is a hate. Okay? You don't have to, just say love, just love and leave it at that. And it works. I, in, I tell you, I have a challenge, the same thing. And people out of the blue had come down and helped me. I was in Amsterdam. My backpack fell down in a canal. Okay? My everything, my passport, my money, everything in a canal. And a canal water moves. Okay? And then somebody, people say, say, say you got to call police. I said, I don't know how to say, cut and cut the, cut the Amsterdam police. They came, they, they, they worked for one hour to find, find my bag, dredging the canal, and it didn't come. Then finally, the man who was head of the team, police department, he said, Raj, can you do one thing? He said, can you, can you give the hand? So my people come there complaining that I'm standing, I'm not doing anything. I said, okay, and, and I took a rope, and I pulled it. And do you know what happened? Yeah. I pulled it, and they saw it back. Whole crowd, about 500 people, they cheered, and I dropped it. And the guy says, right, don't worry about it. We know where it is now. We can get it. They got, they got me. And do you know what other, other miracle happened after that is this? A lady living around there, she was watching this thing. After my backpack came out, and I open it, there was water, my clothes are wet, and she comes and says, do you know Raj? I'm sorry, one minute. Okay. He, he, she says, Raj, he says, hi, my name is this, and I live in a, this building. And uh, she says, uh, give me your clothes, uh, you know, and come back tomorrow and pick it up. Do you know what she did? She washed, dry, folded my clothes. And this lady, I never spoke before, never did anything. Okay? So there are people of goodwill, but you have to be goodwill. You have to yeah, love them. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. All right, next. All right. We have an open mic and we have no speaker. What's this going on here? All right. Hi, um, you know, I'm Ellen Corley, as uh, you all have heard before. Um, it's interesting, you know, the comment Raj made about me seeming to dominate the converse, the questions or comments. And um, I recently had a big insight about that, oh, that I went to a John Dewey school. There's not that many of them. And where we, you know, even in eighth grade, ninth grade, we're in a circle discussing things. That There wasn't really a teacher. The teacher was a facilitator of kind of, you know, the analysis of the texts that we're reading or subjects like life and death. Um, so, I, so good insight this friend gave me. She said most people and that she knew were went to school where there was an authority. And the authority gave the presentation and, you know, the people don't ask questions. They don't make comments. And, you know, so it, um, she goes, that's why everybody's always kind of shutting you up and throwing you under the bus and, and not understanding your cultural style. Um, there is a culture, and a, it's really a, the core basis I, of my philosophy and appreciation of Dewey is that I'm not, I believe the teacher should not, you know, we're all like teachers, we're all like learners, and a teacher should not be with the above or below the other. They should treat them as equals with respect and um, and Thanks. seeking truth and we're all helping each other find the truth. 
So there's a shared learning, you know, collectivist, uh, and I, I really think it's, um, I, I appreciate really Bob's talk about philosophy because it was my favorite course and um, you think, oh, is she a philosopher, you know, but we really, a teacher needs a philosophy. They, they could be taught how to do PowerPoints, they could talk, but really what determines the experience is the teacher's understanding of the role between themselves and the other. And if they consider themselves the, you know, the above, the smart, the elite, the knowledgeable, and the child, the, you know, the empty plate that has to be, blank slate that has to be written to, um, that's, they call that pedagogy. And maybe it's all right for, you know, learning how to spell and things. But uh, at adult level, what we need is pedagogy, which is, or andragogy for adults. They, people want to pull from what they see. They say that's why the internet's good. But unfortunately, I think what we're missing is, you know, like this College of Complexes, but, and I think we're missing particularly this open discussion, even though you think it might be a little chaotic or somebody could dominate the conversation. Uh, but I, you know, I did also was a market research analyst and wrote and analyzed a lot of focus groups. And, you, you know, the job of the moderator is to get the, you know, get the opinion of the group it's a, it's a discovery process. You, you know, it doesn't work if one person dominates. But um, you know, it's interesting. We had a, I had a blow up here once with Tim because he's like, be quiet. You, you know, you've already had your question. Questions only. And, and I was frustrated at the time because it happened to be, they were talking about Milton Friedman and a subject that I felt like I could facilitate the moderating because I would studied it. My, I was, my stepfather was a Mac, you know, Milton Friedman monetarist, and so, you know, I could kind of help facilitate this, which takes a certain level of knowledge. And it's interesting, last night I was talking to a woman who started her own school. 700 people ended up being in it, children. And it's quite an accomplishment, but, um, you know, that's, that's really what I always wanted. Start your own school, it, it, you know, it, there's a problem with institutionalization. And I wrote an essay on that this week that institutions have to be regulated. People have laws. And this idea, I think we've got to where the government is like, okay, let's put a tax on Uber and then we'll solve the problem. And nobody likes it, you know. Um, that's kind of when the institution is making policy. Uh, it, you know, the, it's, it's such a heavy hand, and and every and it's worse when people are blaming, you know, blame the Democrats, blame the Republicans, and, you know, I, I, my concern is about evil, and that there is an evil um, deep state overseeing this, and that there is a deliberate divide and conquer using our um, propaganda, and uh, using Cambridge Analytica, and I've been researching Promise, the software system that was stolen by William Barr in the 80s, that Danny Casalero, they, they sent it through Pilar to, to Israel, and they put a back door in it, and then now they're selling it as Palantir, which is, he's a billionaire who, who it's using, he sells it to the Russians, he sold it to Saudi Arabia, and, and so this is how Saudi Arabia is able to go in there and get the names. They can, the state is, is big brothers, all of them, and, and then they're all got plausible deniability. But I think if we could prove that, that William Barr, the current state's attorney, attorney general who's trying to shut us all up, you know, prove that these guys are an evil cabal that has taken over the country and that is a treasonous crime to sell our software to the Russians and then deny it. And because it, the convenient thing is they have taken over the country. And you, I say it, people go, oh, that's a lie, because it didn't fit your knowledge set. You didn't read it in the news. You didn't hear it in the news. Because we're, you know, 40, 50 years away from 
truth. There's, there has been a revisionist history that is gone, put on, I realize what that means now. The Nazi secret of the CIA being planted throughout our media is they can change history and deny it. Deny that they're having any impact. Oh, look at what a democracy. Let's save the world with democracy. Look at what's really happening, if you can. It's been genocide and murder and takeover. And with our money and our reputation. All right, next. Next, please. Four minutes. Well, um, it's a real pity that uh, technology uh, uh, messed up Bob. He wanted to have uh, some printed notes, and it looked like it really threw him askew. That, uh, uh, so I, I have to say that uh, I'll bet you he would have had a much better presentation um, with notes. It's always easier. I like to have notes myself. It's difficult to, um, you know, Bob is um, a good friend of mine, and um, I, I've enjoyed helping him with his book, even though there are many setbacks in the technical nature, <laughs> which uh, we could go over uh, uh, ad infinitum. And it's just been a real struggle. Finally, it's it's done, and it's unfortunately he only was able to bring one copy tonight, uh, which uh, I'm sure he'll have more next time. So you all come back and get get a hold of those notes. So. Uh, and Bob, I can tell you, um, is a scholar and a gentleman, as the saying goes, <laughs> gentleman and a scholar. He's a very educated man and very erudite, and uh, he writes very well. And uh, of course, this was the, uh, the first book, um, Making Meaning, Welcome to a More Fulfilling and Joyful Life. And he did want to bring, um, in an intellectual way, uh, uh, in a, uh, a thoughtful way, and um, in the style of, uh, of what Socrates uh, is attributed to having said, that, uh, uh, that you should live an examined life. Uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. And, and Bob wanted to bring that out, but he also wanted to have, he didn't want it to all be deep. Um, uh, he wanted to have it, uh, uh, this, this last book was to be more tips for people to add meaning to their lives, uh, however you define it, um, different people have defined it different ways, and uh, I think I think a lot of people don't really understand. Uh, a lot of waste their lives. That's true. We shouldn't dwell on the negative, but a lot of people do um, try to do something productive and, and uh, meaningful in the sense of helping others. So one of the themes that Bob has had, or and a lot of people. Uh, do appreciate and understand art, even if they don't have that much time for it. And, and uh, but uh, uh, I don't have a ton of time, and I didn't I didn't prepare any notes to <laughs> or prepare text for this little for these little comments. But um, in the uh, in the grand scale of things, uh, I also thought that uh, Bob has dealt with those great the big questions, uh, which I've always thought gave meaning to my life contemplating them. Um, and so, uh, you know, my mother bought me a, um, a, a batch of the great books, the, uh, the Mortimer Adler series, you know, the six, 64 volumes, <laughs> and the Syntopicon and all, the great questions of God and the universe and everything and all of that. And uh, I always used to go out and walk under the stars. Yeah. Bob had a picture of the stars and galaxies and and in the little cover I did for him for the current book that uh, he's just completed, I put the stars and galaxies on the, on the cover, and I had Socrates um, telling you to buy the book, but um, really we, we wanted to bring in the idea of Socrates, that the examined life is what's worth living, and, um, and a meaningful life too, um, meaningful uh, in trying to grasp, um, you know, all those stars and galaxies such a huge universe, such such a gigantic universe, um, and a, a seemingly to be an unfeeling universe. But um, whether it's unfeeling or not, and whether there is a uh, an entity of a god or not, um, a, an entity that has a uh, a point of view or an intellect or a, or feelings, 
what we bring to our own lives, um, whatever substance, whatever impact, impact of substance that we can have on our society, our, our, our country, uh, in, including in the political world, because he and I have arguments about that. Um, and I try to bring some of the meaning of my life and uh, trying to have an impact in the political world. So does Ellen here. Uh, whatever we can bring, that is a value. And that's, that's the important thing. That's what we should take away from this. And that how good it is for us to come together as intellectuals, as people that want to debate the great ideas and the great questions of our, of our time. And that we do this is a good thing. And, and Bob has helped us to do that. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Here's something that's missing about Doug. I wonder what happened to his beard. That's number one. Uh, number two, I would like to thank Bob for an excellent talk. He's uh, Doug was quite correct. Bob is a gentleman and a scholar. No, he is. And we want to thank you for your presentation. Uh, number three, with regard to the question of taxes, Justice Holmes once said the taxes were the price that he paid for civilization. Yes. And I happen to go along with that. And finally, with regard to the person who said that she was a product of a John Dewey school, well, I was a product of a Melville Dewey School, one where the school library used the Dewey Decimal System. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Rod is going to take a 30 second pause real quick. I have a short comment. Ellen, I did not mean to be disrespectful. You. you bring a lot to the table. Okay? But when I come to this part, I have respect for all. Lots of other people who come here because uh, I think they are pretty well educated. Um, they are pretty well versed on the issues. And I want, I want to hear from everybody. They need the black so I do not want one yeah. person to take over I, so much time oh, that uh, collective no, because she had knowledge I do not get. And that's what I don't want. Collective knowledge is part of this work. Who's next? So who's gone? And I, no, she just asked me for more coffee, so I ordered more coffee. And I saw it. She had the $5. I think it's our responsibility. But then she you're the collector. I'm not the We're not the waitress. We're I'm not, not the owner restaurant. of the restaurant. Okay, Neither okay, are we. Okay, okay, okay. okay. We'll, we'll handle it. Don't worry. She's just passes it on us. Well, it's part of our group, Charlie. No, it's not. No, it's not. Absolutely, categorically not. These people aren't part of our no, group. No, no. No. That, that we've done enough on this already. We're not taking orders from the hired elf here. Honestly, yeah, can, no, that's not the case. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, let's thank uh, Bob you know, for his presentation. Uh, I'll be eclectic here as usual, you know. What activities should we engage in or should we not engage in? Um, I don't know. Uh, should we be prescriptive or prescriptive in this regard? Um, should we engage in activities which are for which we have a natural inclination? Uh, should we curb certain activities um, which are unnatural? Sometimes you can add, this is what they said, I mean, if you do things according, if the things are used according to their design, they will work, function appropriately. That's why if you have skills in a certain regard, um, you, you often heard the expression, they, they can achieve that effortlessly because uh, they have a natural inclination um, and suitability and suitable. It's an appropriate activity. Um, uh, now, the other thing about a list is there's two ways of looking at a list. Like in a contract, you could you could write a thing like this restaurant will be 
around and was serving did dinner meals for people. Or else you could make a list, you could break down and set one tables will be set, two silver be put on tables and on and on and on. And describe through the entire list. The thing with making a list are is how our omissions and defects, how thorough are you? Yet it's specific and precision. It's not open to interpretation. There's specificity in there. So there's no dispute. So that's the one thing you have to balance. Which do you really need? Um, and does the situation merit it? Um, do people make lists of all the activities they could engage in uh, and then select from those? I'm not certain if we go necessarily through through that kind of inventory. Uh, regarding activities you can engage in, uh, the ancients made a distinction between the liberal and the servile arts, um, which I think underlies Bob's book here, is that he's, he has an inclination towards the liberal art. And the servile arts, uh, which could encompass a lot of things, um, including this guy's baseball game, Thank you. I guess, uh, they're equally meritorious. Uh, if you wish certain trades uh, and manual type activities, such as playing a sport, is, a, is in essence a manual activity, a physical activity. So the distinction there between you know which one we choose, and each are each are suitable, whether one gets manual labor or thought labor, um, each of these activities. I think someone who has never been in an art museum has, can have a life that's very enriching and full of meaning. Um, and that's the only thing that I was thinking of. And last of all, I'd like to say is, there is absolutely no one who can say what existed before the Big Bang. And any statements that you can say that there was no time, there was none of this or none of that, those are invalid. You simply can't indicate that's the limits of our knowledge. And I know what he's trying to say, that there was some sort of God on the other side of this event which is invalid because no one can state, make any statement that's acceptable as to what there was before that. It's a barrier right now. Ago. What? You know, you just said, you just said there, what there was. You said there was nothing. I, you cannot state. You just did. I said it's a barrier. <laughs> you, you, he was, no, he said there was no time. You said there was no time. And there's none of darkness, and there's none of this. And I'm going, you cannot establish it. But many God doesn't need time. Uh, That's the limit. It's, it's like this wall. You cannot state what's on the other side of that wall. It's not difficult. There's no time. You know? can measure time. Just like I cannot indicate what's on the other side of that wall. That's the limit of my knowledge right now. All right. I got, All right, thanks a lot. Can I take three minutes to make a, a comment? Andy, you can I'll take the last rebuttal. All right. You see, I think Aristotle learned a lot of his logic about presentation and emotion and closing from his girlfriend and his mom. I don't know of any man who can win an argument against a woman. Every time you go try to get a woman, they're either going to give you a logical argument and win it, an emotional argument and win it, or a quick closing argument and win it. 
the biggest emotional plea that is ever goes, honey, I don't, or honey, I will, or the logical one. No wonder men had it so bad. Maybe Aristotle was just smart enough to listen. And I think maybe that ought to give, maybe that's why he went down through the history, because he listened to the women in his life. <laughs> All right, Andy. In your closing. I, I, earlier I quoted, uh, there's that famous quote, it was in a, I learned it from an episode of The Twilight Zone when a retired uh, professor was being uh, phased out before he thought he, it was his time in uh, somewhere in an English boarding school. But he, he, the ghosts of his past students came to him and uh, showed him that he did make a difference in their lives. <clears throat> and uh, the quote on his desk, it said, uh, in one of those engraved things says, be ashamed to die until you have won some humanity, some victory for humanity. Be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity, small or large or something. Contribute something. Well, in modern times, we have universal truths, more or less, that are accepted if you don't if you don't, well, there's a universal human trait that has been with us in our genes for a long time. And no matter what political parties we're in, I'll just wait until you guys get through half the conference. Go ahead. Well, well, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, I was violating my own premise. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that, Andy. Um, Today, America is divided between people that know certain facts and people that don't know certain facts. Uh, now, at one time, you could have a debate between the flat Earth side and the round Earth side because they hadn't, didn't have good pictures from the satellites and the space station and everything 500 years ago. Today, you can't debate that. Well. If you you interview parents of all different stripes, you'll find that probably 99% of all adult humans hate child abuse. Child abuse, uh, child abusers don't last long in prison. They get killed. It's a universal human trait to protect children. We're all on the same page on that one. Democrats, Republicans, progressives, Buddhists, Hare Krishnas, doesn't matter. Uh, there, there are some universal things that we agree on. Most of us agree that it's, it's wrong for an owner of a company that sells drugs to let a child die because it, the parents can't afford the medicine. I'm sorry your child is dying, but I need my billions. That's wrong. That's fundamentally evil. And the Mayans left us with a prophecy. In the, uh, the book on Mayan prophecies that were published just before 2012, they said, well, one great cycle ends a new one begins, a 26,000 year cycle ends and you start, you have a decade of rapid change, a fight for the forces of good and the forces of evil are fighting for the soul of humanity. That's how they phrase it. And in this 10 year stretch from 20, December of 2012 to December 22, we're actually seeing that uh, portrayed, uh, you're in, on, in especially in America, but also in around the world, people are, the forces of good are rising up to throw the forces of evil out of their government, right? Not just in America. Today we have the forces of evil that are dominating our government. We have, out of the 535 people in Congress, there's a few dozen of them on both parties, mostly. A few dozen people you can name that are not highly priced, highly paid intellectual prostitutes. That's a dictionary definition of what our Congress critters are doing. Nancy Pelosi is showing us what a, a well-dressed intellectual prostitute looks like. Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell on the other side, is that a bang because somebody objected to what I said or somebody agreed? Agree. Agree. Agree? Yeah. That's what that was? Well, you might agree that Mitch McConnell fits one page in the dictionary. His picture should be right next to the word evil. 
Because people are dying all over this country and all over the world by the hundreds of thousands every year because we've allowed this evil to settle down and occupy our government over the last 40 years. And now the wild card that we're seeing is not political at all. Is up to, I think the latest count is 7 million students of various ages that are out of school every Friday protesting for their future. And they got the science exactly right. Anybody that is a climate denier in this day and age is the closest thing you're going to see to a lawyer standing up in front of a judge saying, Your Honor, the earth is flat, I swear to God. Uh, it's, we're long past the time when we continue to support the evil that has descended on us and has broadcast over 98% of the radio channels in this country known as Fox News. And as uh, one, uh, for those of you that didn't see it, last Friday afternoon, Sean Hannity said that, why are they picking on Donald Trump? President Nixon was impeached for lying to Congress. President Obama, I'm uh, not Obama, but Bill Clinton was impeached for lying to Congress. Trump has never lied to anybody. Why are they picking on him? And this is where we are. We're allowing ourselves to be buried with what I call cribs, criminally insane bullshit. A steady stream of cribs comes out over 560 AM, 890, Fox News. Uh, it's brilliant propaganda. And if we don't do something to fight it and overcome it and elect progressive people that aren't Democrat or Republican, but, but you can't run as a progressive in the Republican Party. If you're a progressive, common sense person, you don't identify with the Democratic Party, but you got to run there to get elected. But um, if you look at these new progressives that got elected, they're not Democrats or Republicans. They're they're common, middle of the road, common sense people that have dedicated their lives to fighting for all people for better health care, you know, uh, just better conditions all across the board and. Fox News people are generating death threats. How many what is that? How times you have to be gone? What? How many times you have to be gone? Your time is up. Oh, right. But well, we didn't gong you, did we? So no, no, I don't want any shit started. about that. Thank you. All right, now. Who's next to me? Are we done? Now go up and up. Let's finish up and. Okay, anybody else? All right, Bob, you get the last word. Oh, no. You get the last word. Get you got gone. Let's get up there. Get your last word up. Yeah, if I was running this show, I wouldn't allow people to go on and on about something that's not the topic. It has no relation whatsoever to the topic. Are you referring to me by any chance? Yeah, we could be us all night long. Who needs it? Things stuff. Hardly worth the time. But I appreciate all your other comments and thank you. I'll try to respond to the main one. Um, one thing I left off is that uh, making meaning is prescriptive. It's something we ought to do. It's something we should do. It's not something we do do. Get it? Do do. Uh, it's not do do. <laughs> Um, it's something we ought to do. What we ought to do the most. And there's no end to learning about meaning and making meaning, as Tim pointed out. It's part of the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, okay, I'll skip a few things here. Uh, meaning is mostly about making love and caring. It's a big part of meaning and making meaning. It's a big part. But everything positive is a part of making meaning. Uh, I've used the word meaning myself, and I counted over 70 different senses, and it's usually to refer to making good, some form of doing good, and love and caring is certainly a hard one, a big one, a main one, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but I still would say it's very hard to get someone to love and care if they, uh, they don't do it. It's pretty much up to them. Um, but it's very important, certainly. Uh, shared learning, I don't think I go that far, Ellen, as you go. Andy, I'm trying to talk to Ellen. You, 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 you talk funny. Where's my phone? Um, shared learning is something 
especially if you got good students to share it with. But um, I don't think I would go that far. I think you, you need someone who knows the topic fully. I had a lot of BS classes in college, you know, and shoot the breeze. Even a professor who hadn't done the work or read the books, because they had tenure, they couldn't be fired anyway, so why bother, why work? And they did, and they just had to be us. I didn't get much out of that, you know, with no teacher. You know, even the professor hadn't read the book we were supposed to talk about. And they couldn't be fired anyway, so uh, they just took it easy. That's the abuse of tenure, which a lot of colleges are getting rid of now, thank God. <clears throat> There's a power play by the professors. Um, yeah, I Charlie says I'm leaning toward the liberal arts rather than the servile arts. Mortimer Adler said, you know, we could learn arts and crafts that enslave us. Do the same stuff all the time, same routine, where we can get liberal arts that can free us to be fully human, that's what making meaning tries to do, free us for the liberal arts. Um, next, yeah, I'm very sorry I had all those problems with computers working today. I, I, it was very aggravating. And I shouldn't have went to the Humanities Festival and, <laughs> and the Art Institute. I thought they would work on me, and they just didn't work. So I'll bring them next week, and they'll be better next week. So I hope you all come. And I'll be able to give it to more people. Well, I would have done that anyway. Because um, as I said, it, it helps a lot for anyone to remember what a person says. You know. Otherwise, you might just have an impression or two. And this way you can put it away, file it, and you can always refer to it. I write down every movie, every play, every talk I go to, I take notes on that. And I go back to them, look them up, and see what they said. And I get a lot out of them. Uh, some of the talks and plays and movies, I don't even remember seeing them, <laughs> much less than what they were about. But when I got little notes in and take notes on them, or have a handout on them, I can get, I can get a lot. A lot. So that's why I do that. I'm not a scholar. I like to think myself as a uh, thinker, creative thinker. I, do. I was trained to do exquisite research and footnotes galore, footnotes up the wazoos, hundreds of them. You should see my dissertation in dozens of pages of footnotes. Now that, that was a hoop I had to lead up, lean, lean, uh, leap over at uh, Tulane University in New Orleans. Where I had a ball. That was great. That was a lot of fun. But um, but I'm not really a scholar. I like to think of myself as a thinker, standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, uh, and um, I am very interested in writing. I always was, and I've always tried to write, refine my writing. <clears throat> Uh, make my writing as simple as clear as I can. I've done many practice hours, revised my books many times. I don't really rewrite the whole thing, but I try to make them simpler and clearer, as I said. And lastly, I think I'm the only uh, person who's been going to the college complex as longer than anyone else, longer than Charlie. Sid used to be me, but he doesn't come anymore because he can't get a ride. Where is Sid? He, he just can't get a ride. His ride doesn't like the college anymore. But, uh, but I've been going to the college on a fairly regular basis since 1979 when I came back to uh, Chicago from New Orleans. And the college would have disappeared a long time ago if it wasn't for Charlie's efforts to keep it going. So let's give Charlie a hand. That's it for tonight. Thank you. Gavin LaSalle, Andy. my life. Yeah. <laughs> you all did my life. Uh, thank our speaker tonight. Give our speaker a note of big hand for a good presentation. Thank you, Bob. And uh, we're adjourned for the evening. We'll see you all next week. We're out.